Thank you for the introduction. So uh, today I get the privilege to talk to you about uh, variational autoencoders and diffusion models. Um, well, I only have a short amount of time to cover a lot of uh, space. Um, I will talk a lot about some of the joint work that I've been doing with some of my great colleagues at Google. And also, um, I got to borrow some of their material. Um, so I want to start by thanking them. Uh, in particular, there's this, uh, this uh, tutorial at CVPR, and they have a great website. And they have a lot more material on diffusion models um, if you want to learn more after the talk. Um, so for today, I'll basically, the talk will basically consist of four parts. Um, I'll start by saying some general things about latent variable models and to kind of contrast that with the class of autoregressive models that uh, Noel was talking up about before the break. Um, then I'll introduce variational autoencoders. Um, after that, I'll discuss diffusion models as really a special case of uh, VAEs. And then I'll finish by saying a few more things about text to image models, which I think is the most exciting development in this space uh, recently. Um, yeah, so that being said, I apologize ahead of time if I'm leaving out your favorite work or your, your own work. Um, it's, a, it's really only a small selection of all the, all the great content that's available to discuss here. So latent variable models. Um, in a autoregressive model of the type that uh, Null discussed earlier, we have this property that all the random variables that we're predicting or generating, they're actually observed in the data. Whereas with a latent variable model, we're creating additional variables that we never observe, latent variables. Um, and typically they have a particular structure to them. So the typical latent variable model might look like this image on the right here, where you first generating some variable Z, and then you're generating another variable Z conditions on that, and so forth, until you actually get at the data. Um, so this top-down structure is, is quite interesting, and there's a lot of work on what sort of structure is really what we want here and what we can do with these things. Um, yeah, one, one interesting connection I, I wanted to make is the work by Carl Friston. So he is probably the, the, uh, the most cited neuroscientist uh, in the entire world. And his theory of intelligence is that intelligence is nothing else but inference in a latent variable model. So that's really potentially how powerful this framework is and how far reaching it can be. Uh, for this talk, I'll be a bit more practical and, and focus more about just uh, generating pretty images and, and making these models actually work in practice. Um, so the key challenge in any latent variable model is how do you estimate the model? So with a fully observed model, like an autoregressive model, we can just calculate the likelihood and then optimize it. And then uh, we have a loss going down. And if it goes down enough, we'll have pretty images. But for a latent variable model, the, the likelihood itself is actually not tractable. Um, so uh, we would like to maximize the probability of generating a particular image X. But in order to calculate that, we actually need to integrate out all these latent variables. And that integral is usually not something we can actually calculate. Um, so there's a, a long line of work on all kinds of different smart tricks in how to address this, this inference problem, this problem of um, making the, the latent variable model trainable. And I just want to mention a few, uh, just to give you a historical perspective. Um, so in 2006, there were the restricted Boltzmann machines that were uh, very hot. Um, so they are basically a single layer of discrete latent variables that this, that's, um, um, generates a, uh, a visible layer of data below. And um, yeah, there's inference algorithms you can run. They're basically GIP sampling, so MCMC. And by doing that in a smart way, you, these models actually become trainable and you can kind of generate MNIST a little bit. And this seems incredibly quaint right now, but this is actually one of the key ingredients that started off the whole deep learning revolution. Um, and also shows you how far we've come. So then in 2013-2014, uh, variational autoencoders were invented. So they instead have a, late, an, a continuous latent space. Uh, so in this demo by my colleague uh, Dirk Kingma, he has a 12-dimensional latent space that also generates MNIST. And then you can uh, play with these 12 latent dimensions and you see the data change as a result. Um, so here we're forcing a 
smooth relationship between the latents and the, the output data, which you can then explore by, uh, by, by adjusting your latents. You can do the same thing with other data domains. So for example, with, image, with, uh, with faces. Uh, of course, we're also now way beyond this. And um, yeah, the, the, where we are currently with this class of models is, um, is these, uh, these text to image models like Imagine um, that use diffusion, which is also a latent variable model, but it is currently um, generating images that are like very close to actual um, high quality images that you would take with your own, uh, your own camera. Um, so this has been made possible by a number of things. Uh, the most important one is still compute. So the amount of compute that we have available in AI to, to train our biggest model seems to double about every six months, at least over the last uh, 12 years or so. So that over 12 years, that actually amounts to about a factor of 10 million in increase in compute. And interestingly, this is actually still ongoing. Um, Nvidia is still making new chips. Uh, Google is building new TPUs. And I think for this reason, it's really a very exciting time to, to uh, be present in this field, um, because I can only imagine what the field will look like in 12 years from now. Uh, that being said, algorithms still matter a lot also. It's not just compute. In particular, something like these restricted Boltzmann machines or these deep belief nets, uh, they wouldn't be so easy to scale up. It's not like you just put them on the TPU and they would do the same thing. We have also made a lot of advances in algorithms. Um, so I will say a little bit about VAEs, which is one formulation of a latent variable model that is much easier to train. Um, and as you can scale up a bit further, it still has its challenges. And then diffusion models is what I view as the current kind of like best form of, of this type of model. That is even easier to train, easier to scale up. So variational autoencoders, um, they try and address this, this problem of integrating out this set of latent variables by turning it into an inference problem. So what we would like to do is maximize the log likelihood of our data, um, which is the log of this integral. Um, but you can also write that as an expectation over the posterior distribution. So that's on the right here. Um, so now, if you want to evaluate this thing on the right, the trick is how do you evaluate this posterior distribution? So how do you infer what the latent variables were given the data that you observe? Um, so in variational inference, what we do is we cast this as an optimization problem. So we take the, the integral, we put in a factor of one, basically, and then we apply Jensen's inequality to write this as an expectation over this Q distribution that we introduced. So here Q is like an arbitrary distribution over the latent variables, and we can optimize over it to make this bound tight, and then we can hopefully learn something that's very close to maximizing the likelihood. Um, Q is often just a parametric distribution, like a Gaussian, um, but it can, in theory, be anything as long as it makes the problem more tractable. Um, so variational inference has been around for quite a while, and the main insight that um, the developers of variational in, uh, autoencoders had is that we can amortize inference. So amortizing means that rather than learning this Q distribution anew, like at every data point that we observe, we actually define it to be the output of a model, and the model takes in the data X and then spits out the parameters of this Q distribution. And that allows you to do the training much more efficiently because you kind of amortize the cost of inference over many examples. Um, so here we have an inference model that takes in X and it spits out a distribution over these latent variables, and it's coupled with a generative model. So that's the latent variable model that goes the other way around. If you put them together, you get a variational lower bounds. So that's the a lower bound to the log likelihood I showed in the last slide. And what you now do is you optimize both together. So in general, it's actually very difficult to accurately capture a high dimensional posterior distribution. Yeah, even with a powerful neural network, it's very hard to do. Um, but the nice thing here is that because you uh, optimize the approximation, the approximate posterior, the inverse model, jointly with the generative model, the two kind of like have an incentive to, co to cooperate. So the generative model will adjust its weight such that its posterior distribution actually becomes somewhat easier to approximate. And for that reason, this can actually work. Um, training itself is done by something called the reparameterization trick. So we now have a loss that's an expectation 
over a complicated distribution that's a function of some high dimensional set of parameters. How do you optimize this? Well, um, well what they did with variational autoencoders is basically to use auto uh, differentiation. So what you do when you sample is you take some noise. So this might be standard Gaussian noise or uniform or maybe just like the random seed of your, your sample. There's some feedback here. Okay, thanks. Um, so you, you get your samples by doing a deterministic transformation of the random noise and your parameters into this latent Z. And now you just plug it in. Now you just plug this in into your loss function and you get a Monte Carlo approximation of this lower bound. So this is a Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation that we would like to calculate. And what you can now do is if you put the, uh, if you try and differentiate this, you can actually move the differentiation inside of the expectation. So in the end, what we have is we have an expectation over this standard noise distribution that doesn't contain any trainable parameters. And only inside the expectation, we have a gradient. And this is something we can calculate. Now we can do stochastic gradient descent and now we can learn our models. Um, so this is a trick that actually in the statistics and in the econometrics literature probably has been used for like 30 years. Um, but for in, in machine learning, this was very new at the time and this really enabled this model class to be trained. Uh, yeah, so that being said, VAEs still have a, a number of challenges that make them not super easy to use in practice. Um, and the main one is related to the way the loss works, basically. So um, when you look at the variational lower bounds, there's a reconstruction term, how uh, well can we reconstruct the data? But there's also a term that says, how closely does our inference model match the prior that we have on the latent variables? So that's an information bottleneck. So what the model tries to do with it, it tries to do, it tries to minimize the reconstruction error but it also tries and minimize the information that flows through this bottleneck. Now, if there's anything we've learned in deep learning so far, is that we never want to minimize the amount of information we can propagate. We always want to maintain all the information we can. That's why ResNet works so well. Um, uh, you never put a, you never put dropout or normalization on, on the main path in the ResNet. You just want the information to keep flowing. So, that same dynamic is at work here, and that makes it actually kind of difficult to optimize this. And this can result in bad local minima. So a, one of these bad local minima that you can get stuck in is called posterior collapse. So what happens is that maybe at the start of training, like this Z3 is actually not very useful for reconstruction because the model hasn't learned how to use it yet. And then what you will end up doing is you will, you will minimize the, the discrepancy between its distribution and its prior which means that the model just says, well, if, it, this, 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 if this variable is useless, I'll just set the information content that it propagates to zero. But once it does that, you will never learn how to use it again because it's now a useless variable. So this is one of these local, that local minima that you can get stuck in. Um, and this is one of the reasons that, at least until recently, autoregressive models have actually been better at both sample quality and at likelihood. There is a number of tricks you can use to kind of address this problem. Um, one of the most important ones is called a letter VAE. Um, so what you do here is you realize that maybe this order of generation, of generating latest is not optimal. Um, so in this, uh, in this picture here, this Z3 is very far away from the data and it takes a long time for its information to propagate back to the data through the model. And for that reason, it's very easy to kind of forget about this variable. Um, so what we can do is in, instead is we flip around the order of generation. So what we do is we actually start by generating the top level latent variable given the data. Then we generate the next one, but we actually condition it on the first level also. So we keep around this, uh, this latent variable. And then uh, finally we do the last latent variable, again conditioned also on the latent we've uh, generated so far. So now we are always uh, keeping this latent variable around um, and it's uh, somewhat harder for the model to completely forget about this, uh, this variable. So this, uh, this works uh, quite a bit better. Um, there's a bunch of other tricks that you need to practice often, but this is the, one of the key ones. So when you uh, 
you put these tricks together and you make your model extremely deep, that is when these VEs really start working very well. Um, so the, there's a, a number of papers in this field, but I think the one of the clearest ones where they show this principle is uh, this, this paper by Rion Childs, where they basically use this, this letter VE trick and depth, and those are really the main ingredients that make uh, their model work quite well. And then if you add enough, add enough layers, then this actually becomes quite competitive with autoregressive models. And according to this paper, at least it can even outperform autoregressive models. Um, yeah, for the next part of the talk, I'll talk about diffusion models, which is um, a, a new version of FEE, which I think is, has an even better answer to some of these challenges. So diffusion models are really just a special case of VEEs. Um, they were already proposed in 2015 by Yasha Soldikstein, one of uh, our colleagues at Google, but it took quite a while for it to become popular. Um, it uh, yeah, just was missing a few tricks when, when it was first invented. Um, the main property that makes it work well is that it's like an extremely deep VE. In some formulations of the model, it might actually have infinitely many layers if you consider it to be a VE. Um, and in addition, it has an encoder which doesn't have any parameters. So that makes the problem a lot simpler and it actually removes many of these uh, bad local minima that you might get stuck in otherwise. Um, and then the final bit that sets it apart from other VEs is that it has a variational lower bound that actually decomposes into many independent terms that you can evaluate independently. So now training by stochastic gradient descent becomes much faster since you can pull apart all these different terms. You don't need to evaluate the whole infinitely many layer VE. Yeah, conceptually what it does is it starts with the data and then what your inference model, your Q distribution does is it adds Gaussian noise all the way until you're at the point where you just have basically pure Gaussian noise. And then the generative model tries to invert this process. So it starts with the very noisy data and then cleans it up a little bit, one little step at a time until you're back at the data. Um, so more formally, um, I'll, I'll define what this process actually does. So uh, we now are in a process where we have T discrete steps in our diffusion process. And at each step, we add a little bit of Gaussian noise. Um, so I'll use this notation. So we add uh, noise of variance beta t. And we also scale down the original data a little bit, um, just so the norm of the data is approximately constant over the length of the diffusion process. And you know this is always a good thing when you normalize your data before you put it into a neural net. Sure. So I never understood why you need to rescale down. Um, what is making the size of your data increase as you go in time? Um, so what we do is we add noise on every step. And there's also formulations that don't do the scaling down. So it's not strictly necessary. Um, but if you look at the norm of the data, and you add independent Gaussian noise, so it's independent of the data, then the norm of your data will be what you started with, the squared norm plus all the variances of the noise you've added over time. So if you keep adding noise, the norm grows linearly with time or linearly with the variances that you add. And um, yeah, maybe at the end of the process, your, your norm will be 10 times what you, what you started with. So if you, if you start from an image that is 512 by 512. So the, the dimension of the data doesn't change, but the, the the, side, the pixels are all, they all start between minus one and one if you rescale or be between zero and 255 originally. And then maybe if there were between zero and 255, then maybe at the end, uh, the data will actually range from minus 10,000 to 10,000. Uh, so in that way, the size increases, but it's not the dimension of the data. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so in a sense, it is actually the same thing as an autoregressive model, like the one uh, Noel talked about earlier, but now it's autoregressive over noise levels. So we generate each of these noise levels in time, and the, the joint distribution is, can be written down as, as a autoregressive model over noise levels. <clears throat> 
Um, so then the, a nice property of this is that if we want to jump to any intermediate step, so maybe we want to get the, the fourth iterate of this diffusion process, we can actually do so directly. We don't need to generate all the, the intermediate steps. So we have this new quantity called alpha bar, which is just a product of the one minus betas of all the variances that we've added so far. And now we can actually calculate the marginal distribution of x4 given x0 in one go. And it's, it's given uh, by this, so it's the same structure uh, as we had before, where we're uh, rescaling the data, but now by different quantity, and we're also adding independent Gaussian noise with, a, again, a, a different uh, quantity of it. And this will make it very easy to pick out any one of these terms and um, evaluate the, the elbow, the variational lower bound term that corresponds to it without having go, to go through all the layers. And this is also fundamentally different with other VEEs where, uh, because your whole layer, your, your whole transition is learned between every step, you, there's really no way around evaluating all the steps in sequence. Um, right, so we sample from this distribution by sampling some standard Gaussian noise epsilon and then transforming it as, as, as such. Um, and this epsilon will actually be important later on. And so that's why I'm highlighting it here a little bit. Um, this, this noise quantity is really a, a very nice way to think about this, this process. And it's actually what we'll end up predicting eventually. Um, and then the, the, these betas, they remain as a hyperparameter. Um, and in general, we can do whatever we want, we want with them. And there's a whole range of papers that talk about how to best set these hyperparameters to get the optimal results. Uh, but one constraint that we kind of need to keep in mind is that we at least make it such that at the end of our diffusion process, we're at something that resembles pure Gaussian noise. Because pure Gaussian noise, we actually know the distribution of, so we can sample it. Um, but it does mean that we need to add enough noise during training that we actually get there. <clears throat> So the reverse process is really our generative model, and that's the part that we, that we actually learn. And we'll give it a structure that is actually very similar to the forward process. So um, again, at every point, we do a little transformation and we add Gaussian noise. Um, so to be precise, the distribution of, um, so given a very noisy point xt, the distribution of the, the point in time that is slightly less noisy, is given by this Gaussian. So there's a learned mean function that is a, an output of your neural net. And there's typically a fixed variance, which is a hyperparameter. And I'll talk about more about how to set that later on. Um, and then typically we use a, a unit, which is a particular structure of neural nets. And effectively what this model does is denoising. So it takes in noisy data and it tries to predict data that's a bit less noisy which is also comes from a, a very long line of work on, on denoising and how that is useful for all kinds of things from representation learning to generation. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have very much time to go into the details there. Uh, again, we can actually see this as an autoregressive model also, uh, but autoregressive over the noise levels again instead of over the pixels. <clears throat> so for learning this model, we treat it as a variational autoencoder with a variational lower bound on the local likelihood. Um, and the original uh, paper that proposed this, as well as more recent follow-up work, they show that this lower bound actually decomposes as follows. So there's three terms here. The first term is the KL divergence between our final noisy iterate from our forward process and the prior. So in this case, the prior would just be standard Gaussian noise. So this is just a function of our hyperparameters and should be, these hyperparameters should be set such that this is a very low number. So we can kind of forget about this term. Uh, similarly, at the end here, we have like the final reconstruction term. So it says, how likely is our data given the least noisy latent variable that we have? Again, it's a function of just our latent variables and should be set such that this is also very small. So I'll assume that we can also forget about this term. And then the only thing that's left is um, for every time step, we have a, a KL divergence between a true posterior of the less noisy data and our model. <clears throat> so here, the Q distribution is the exact posterior given our clean data and our very noisy data. What's the distribution of our 
slightly less noisy data. And it's actually a tractable Gaussian distribution, just because the, of the very simple structure that we have in defining our forward diffusion process. So it looks like this. Um, important bits are we can actually define the, the mean and we can calculate it. And uh, in this case, we also have the exact uh, variance. So this is fully known, no approximations needed. <clears throat> now, the model will also be Gaussian, but with a learned mean, uh, which means that the uh, KL divergence actually simplifies a lot. So assuming the, uh, the variance will actually be the same for both cases, um, the KL will just boil down to the, the norm of the difference of the two means. So the only thing that will be different between the generative process and the exact posterior is that um, we have to estimate what the actual posterior mean was. And the squared errors, they add over time, and that's exactly what the lower bound then really boils down to. <clears throat> um, so for the particular parameterization that people often use, it's, uh, it's again good to recall, as I showed on the last slide, that the exact posterior mean is, has this particular structure where we have both the current data points, our current set of noisy data that we observe, and it has the noise that we did not observe, but that's the noise that we added. So what people often do, and what tends to work very well in practice, is that we use the same structure in our model, in our modeled mean. So that's the same structure. The only difference now is that we actually, we don't observe the noise that we've added, but we have to reconstruct it from the data. So we plug in the noisy data, we also plug in the time step, which tells us how much noise we've added. And now we have a prediction of what the noise is that we added. And if you put it all together, this actually uh, gives you a mean on, um, on the next level of your generative model to, that you want to sample from. <clears throat> um, if you plug that in into this equation here, then actually it simplifies. And now what we have is we have the norm of the original noise minus its prediction. Um, so we can view it as, you can view this loss from many different angles. We can see, we can view it as a denoising loss where we denoise towards our original data. We can view it as a sort of intermediate denoising loss where we denoise towards something that's slightly less noisy than what we started with. Or we can view it like a kind of a funky denoising process that actually doesn't denoise to the clean data, but it denoises to the noise that we put in. And these are all equivalent. Um, so noise and data and intermediate latent variables are all just linear transformations of each other. So we can go back and forth any of these representations. Um, but for optimization purposes, we usually use this one because it's, um, it puts everything on the same scale. Uh, it's kind of like uh, if you're predicting the noise, it's kind of like predicting the residual in a ResNet in a sort of way. Right, so putting the whole variational lower bound together, we get this quantity here, um, which has these, uh, these prediction errors, but also this weighting factor in front. So this weighting factor just simply tells you, if you care about likelihoods, how much should you weight each of these noise levels in the process? Um, and if you care about likelihood, this is what you should use, but often we don't really care about likelihood. What we care about is generating pretty images, right? Um, and this, our, our measure of perceptual quality is actually quite different from likelihood. Um, so if you want to generate all the eight bits in an RGB color channel, like now I was talking about, um, getting the last bit wrong actually barely changes your image at all, whereas getting the first bit wrong has a much deeper impact. And for that reason, uh, in autoregressive models, you might actually adapt the order in which you generate these bits, as, as Noel was saying. Uh, another way of getting the same kind of effect is um, to just you know, take this factor here and just set it to one. So now we weight each of these noise levels equally, and we don't have this effect where we put too much emphasis on like the small little details in the image. Um, and what people have found empirically is that this improves the perceptual quality that you get out of these models. There's more advanced methods of, of using, of picking these, uh, these weighting terms. Um, and there's much work left to be done there, I think. Um, but for now, uh, this formulation gets you like 99% of the way there. So to summarize what these models do, it's really quite simple, actually. Um, when we're training, 
we just take an example from our data distribution. We uniformly pick a time step along this continuum of, of noise levels. We draw some standard Gaussian noise. We add it into our, our data. So here we have our noisy data. Then we predict our, the noise that we put in. We take the squared error. We take the gradient of that, and that is what we use for stochastic gradient descent. Um, no, so the noise, the noise level is actually, um, so we're sampling in one go, right? So we don't have separate noise for each, each time step here, but rather we have separate noise for each uh, training example that we train on. Um, so if you want to simulate the whole Gaussian diffusion process, you would have different noise levels per, per time step. But kind of the neat thing about this is that we don't need to. Um, and this actually makes this much more much easier, much cheaper to evaluate, right? So if we were to evaluate the whole variational lower bound, there would be T of these terms, and it would be T times as expensive to actually get a gradient to train on. Uh, here we're, you know, we just have an example that's quite, quite quick to calculate. So sampling is also quite easy. We just reverse this process. Uh, we start with Gaussian noise, and we set up the hyperparameters in such a way that that is actually approximately the correct distribution for the first latent variable. And then we go back in time towards the clean data, and at every point in time, we get some new noise. We calculate the, the posterior mean using that, that formula that I showed previously, where the, all we do is we replace the unknown noise by our model prediction, and we add the remaining noise representing our remaining uncertainty. And we do this at t times until we're left at the, the clean data, or at least a approximate sample of the clean data. Uh, so yeah, again, this is the posterior mean. <clears throat> so in practice, the models that people use for this are UNETs. So UNETs are a particular model class that map images to images. They're very popular, for example, in the image segmentation, um, especially in the, the medical domain. Um, and they, they're kind of like a, a pyramidal uh, bottleneck network uh, where they downsample the image a couple of times, but then they also upsample again, going back to the original image size. And there are shortcut connections in between that make sure you don't lose any information. Now, the only thing that we really needed to add here on top of that to make it work for our particular use case is that we need to represent time in some way. So we need to tell the model how much noise is present at a particular time step so the model knows uh, what to look for, whether it needs to look for coarse features or fine features later on during sampling. Um, so that's done by just taking the time step, which is usually you know, some, some uh, quantity between zero and one, for example, uh, calculate a Precision embedding, so that means uh, you, you, you calculate some cosines and some sines on this T variable. You put them through a number of uh, MLP layers, and you just feed that into every single neural net layer in the stack. Um, so uh, Jonathan told me that he actually originally just copied this from my pixel CNN work, which is actually one of the um, older RESM models that uh, Null talked about. Um, and since then, a lot of people have been trying to improve upon this modeling framework, but it's actually surprisingly hard. So it seems like this is just a very natural way of actually capturing this distribution. Um, yeah, of course, there's some normalization, some attention, and some other stuff that is somewhat newer and that has been developed over the last few years, but this basic structure uh, seems to work quite well. <clears throat> Any questions before we move to the continuous time formulation of this? Distributions. Oh, sorry. Regarding the time step T, right. uh, I see that in, during training you sample from that uniform distribution. Right. Do you try other distributions as well? Right, so, um, so T is just really an intermediate quantity, right? And it's, the, uh, it's really the, um, this alpha bar here, which is a function of T where its impact is, is realized. 
Um, and this, this alpha is now a hyperparameter. So we, we get to pick it. You can actually even learn it. So I have a paper called Variational Diffusion Models where we learn it in such a way that the variance of this loss is minimized. You can also do that. Um, you can also treat it like a hyperparameter and pick it in such a way that the images that come out look most perceptually appealing. And uh, so just work on that also. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's mostly an empirical problem at this point. Uh, I have a question also. Sure. Uh, uh, implementation consideration. So in many domains, there is not so much billions of data images. Uh, and since this architecture seems to need quite a lot of depth to have many level of noise, I guess the more the better. Is there some rule of thumb for the number of parameters and the data that you have? Yeah, number of parameters is always a difficult quantity to reason about since it matters a lot whether like a parameter is convolutional or whether it like just happens all the way at the end where you have very little uh, spatial structure. Um, and also what we find to work well in practice is also some regularization. So rather than making our models extremely small for like a data set like CIFAR, we add a lot of dropout. Um, so I, I can't give you like a fixed number. And what we do see is that sort of the, the choices you make inside of defining these particular layers, they do depend on how much data you have available. So if you have a lot of data available, you, might, you want to make them very wise and you want to add a lot of attention. Um, if you don't have very much data, then maybe you stick just stick with convolutional layers with fewer channels. Uh, and a small uh, second question regarding the source of noise. I know we, Gaussian is fairly popular, but in nature we see there are much more random source of noise. Is there work uh, focusing on other sources of noises? Yeah, so there's uh, there are several works where they use different sources of noise. Um, it's a little bit challenging though, like, um, so one of the main properties that makes this work is, is this property, right? So we're able to both define the process as consisting of a lot of little small steps, and we're also able to define the marginals in one go. And that is quite particular to Gaussians, right? So if you add a bunch of Gaussians together, what you're left with is a Gaussian. That's not true of almost any other distribution. Um, there's some some exceptions, but basically it's not true of any other distribution. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask if there's any relation between the number of time steps that we choose and the final quality of the samples generated. Right. Um, so we can only give you a very strong answer if your model is perfect. So if you're actually if you have enormously large model, enormously large data, you learn perfectly, then you always want to take as many steps as you want as you, as you can that will lead to the best quality. In practice, there's some modeling errors and it's not always true, but to a, to a first approximation, more steps is better. And then it's really just a trade-off between how fast you can sample and um, uh, to what quality here is sufficient for you. Thank you. Uh, so I think that's actually kind of a nice bridge maybe into the next part that I wanted to discuss, um, which is what happens if you take infinitely many steps. So I just said more steps is better. So you know, why, why stick with a finite number? Um, turns out that if you let the number of steps go to infinity, you can actually do that. And the formalism is then that of stochastic differential equations. So rather than having some discrete progression here, we now have a stochastic differential equation where we have a drift term. So that's basically the part that is rescales your data. And we have this, this Brownian motion term. So, um, Rather than adding a fixed bit of random noise every time, we have now have a, 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 a Gaussian process that we sample from. Um, somewhat more uh, interestingly and, and less uh, straightforward is the fact that actually under this specification, we now also have a, a stochastic differential equation for the posterior, so for going the other, way, other direction. And unlike the posterior that I showed you earlier, it doesn't depend on the clean data itself, that actually depends on the gradients of the log density of the intermediate data points. Uh, so what this thing here says is that if we want to sample from this model, we have a drift term, that's the same thing as here, so that just depends on this alpha or beta hyperparameter, so that's fine. It has also this gradient term, and that is calculated by taking like an intermediate distribution, like maybe this time step, 
um, calculating the the dense the, the, the log density of this marginal distribution and then taking the gradient of that. So that's not something we can easily calculate, but if we if we could, then we could actually sample from this process exactly by following this reverse stochastic differential equation. Um, so that's described in more detail in this particular paper. Uh, this won the best paper award at iClear, I believe. And it's yeah, really quite a mind-blowing result, I think. So definitely worth reading that paper if you haven't already. Um, so this now connects what, we're, what we haven't been doing all along to score matching. So score matching is something that's been around for a bit longer. It's like an alternative method to estimate models. And it's usually used for models where we don't have a normalizing constant, like an energy-based model. And what you actually do in score, in score matching is that you take this intermediate gradient that, we, that I just talked about, and you uh, try and approximate it with a model. And it turns out that actually, if you do the math, this is actually exactly the same as the thing we've been doing all along. And the relationship is that the gradient of this intermediate is approximately able, approximately uh, equal to this model prediction. And this model prediction in turn is proportional to the predicted noise. So what you get is you, pre you get predicted noise times kind of like the marginal noise level at that time step. Um, so what we've been doing all along, although we've formulated this as a VAE, is actually also, can also be considered score matching. And now we can, what we can do is we can just plug in this model, the prediction, into this SDE, and now we have an SDE that actually describes the sampling process. Um, even more amazing, I think, is that there also exists a deterministic version of this, so an ordinary differential equation rather than a stochastic differential equation, um, that actually does the same thing. So we start out with this SDE, and now we remove the stochastic part, and now we are left with something called uh, like an ODE, so it actually has one fewer uh, of the contribution of the score function is smaller, and it lacks this, this noise term. And this actually gives you a deterministic transformation from noisy images, so it's a unique de deterministic transformation, and it has the particular property that actually it has the same marginal distributions and the same sampling distribution eventually as this SDE, um, but it doesn't involve any noise. Uh, this is called the probability flow ODE, and it's derived in the same paper I showed you earlier. Um, yeah, so kind of graphically, what, what does this mean? How do these two relate? Um, so for the SDE, we start with random noise, and then we have these stochastic sampling paths over time that take us to the clean data distribution. So here, you, it's kind of messy, right? You see lots of different paths that a sample can take. That's because we add noise, and the, the noise every time we sample is different, so there's different paths that you can take to go from one noise uh, latent to one image. Whereas on the ODE side, we now actually have a deterministic transformation from data to image. So now all the paths are nicely smooth. They don't typically cross. Um, it's, there's a unique mapping from noise to image. And it's also well identified. We can actually reason about what sort of function this has to be. Um, so that's the, the, the qualitative difference. Um, looking at the SDE and the ODE in a bit more detail, we can take the SDE on the bottom left here and we can split it up into two parts. So what I've done here is I've isolated the part that's actually equal between the two. And then we have this remainder term. Um, and this remainder term can actually be recognized as Langevin dynamics. So Langevin dynamics is a particular technique in Markov chain Monte Carlo that allows you to approximate any distribution if you just know its score. So you don't know to have to know it's normalized a constant, you don't have to be able to sample from it explicitly, you just have to evaluate its, its score. So one way of thinking about what the SDE is really doing is exactly the same thing as the ODE, but it has this error correction mechanism. And for that reason, in practice, we find that the SDE or the stochastic version of this works a little bit better than a deterministic sampler often. Of course, in practice, uh, we, we cannot actually solve these SDEs and ODEs to arbitrary precision. Uh, our computers, they, they don't run in infinite time. They, they run in finite discrete steps of time. So we need to discretize this thing again if we're actually able to use it in practice. Um, there's different schemes you can use. So the standard scheme for SDEs is called euler moriyama um, But really, our ancestral sampler, so the sampler we started with, is actually also a discretization of this process. 
Um, so you can reason about this in two ways. You can either start with a discrete VE, make it infinitely deep, and then you're at an SDE, or you can, you know, you can define your model as an SDE, and then you approximate it by something in discrete time, and then you're back at, uh, at the diffusion or the, at the VE that you started with. And the same thing can be done for ODEs, and then we have Euler's method, a different discretization. But in practice, what we often use is, is called this thing called DDIM. Um, so it's a particular discretization of the ODE. It was actually motivated originally as being a non-Markovian formulation of diffusion. Um, but I find it most insightful just to think about it as a different way of integrating this ODE and solving for the initial condition, which is your image. <clears throat> So kind of the nice property that these deterministic samplers have is that we now have a, we now have a clear deterministic identifiable mapping from noise to image. And we can hopefully approximate that mapping in a very cheap way and make sampling faster. And that is what we aim to do in this uh, progressive distillation paper. So we start out on the left here, where in this image we're taking four sampling steps. So we've discretized the process into four discrete steps. Um, it's more like 4,000 in practice, maybe, uh, but just to, uh, to give you a sense. And then what we do is in progressively in many steps, we halve the number of steps that we need, and we do that through distillation. So you might take these first two steps here and distill them into a model that is able to take the same step, the same deterministic step, in one go. And we do the same thing with the last two steps, also distilled into one model. And now we have a sampler that takes half as many steps as what we started with. Uh, and then we can iterate this process. So we do it again, and now we have a sampler that only takes a single step uh, to sample. And in practice, what we can do is we can start with samplers that take maybe like 4,000 steps, and we can bring it back to as few as eight to maybe four steps without losing very much in terms of sample quality. And this is really key if you actually want to use these models in practice, because uh, otherwise they would be much slower than, for example, a GAN. Um, so this is what the progressive distillation algorithm looks like when you use it for training. Um, the, on the left is standard diffusion model training, on the right is this progressive distillation. And now the main, the, the key difference is how we define the target that we're denoising towards. So yeah, to make things a little bit complicated, I actually now define uh, the model in terms of X prediction. So we're predicting the clean data rather than the noisy data or rather than the noise. But as I said before, they're all just linear transformations of each other. So rather than denoising towards our clean data, what we do is we run two steps of this DDIM sampler, so two steps of deterministic ODE integration. Uh, we get a result, and then we back out what our one-step prediction needs to be in order to match the two-step uh, ODE result. And now we put this result as the target of our denoising process. So now Rather than denosing towards the clean data, we denose towards the target that's provided by this two-step sampling procedure. Uh, so that works quite well, um, at least until like eight steps or so. Right, um, so that's kind of the theory part of, uh, for diffusion models. Um, and I would now like to take a bit more time to, uh, to talk about text image models and imagine specifically, which I think is kind of like the most exciting demonstration of this. Uh, but before I move on, is there any more questions? I have to. Uh, there are many diffusion models that you can use normal. Uh, my understanding from what I've been reading is that from all the family of normal diffusion models, uh, the typically known or Stein Ullenbeck, for example. I think um, the reason why you use this one with Langevin dynamics is because you have that square root that I was asking. And that that square root is complicating you to get a um, closed form solution. Um, but otherwise, any there are many other SDEs with normal transitions that could potentially work. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we could generalize this. Um, so one thing is this hyperparameter, like you're talking about the square roots on, on the beta. That's just a hyperparameter. We can do any rescaling. Uh, we can 
have a little bit noise for, at first and then lots of noise or the other way around. So, so those are hyperparameters that are actually encompassed in this, in this framework just by changing the, the definition of the, the betas and the, and the alphas. Um, what you can also do is you can uh, not have the noise be independent across dimensions, for example. You can rotate into a different basis or you can add one complicated form of noise on one step and another form of noise on another step. You, you're free to do that. But in general, if you use any sort of general high dimensional covariance matrix, then it becomes more difficult and more expensive to calculate these intermediate distributions. So that, that is a limitation in practice. And have you considered then, yeah, for example, why, why not an orstein nullenbeck model or any of those uh, for the SD? Right, so, so you do want to be able to evaluate these marginals exactly, um, which this framework seems to be sufficient for. Uh, so the, the class is slightly, slightly wider in practice, but uh, yeah, in, in practice, this is just a simple hyperparameter. So if we increase the, the space of the possible hyperparameters too, too much, then uh, yeah, we don't see that much benefit from that. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. Hi, great talk. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, so with a lot of these diffusion models, the forward diffusion is deterministic and the reverse diffusion is trying to recover the forward diffusion. So we don't really have inference per se, as we do in something like VAEs where we infer the latent variable. Uh, do you have any thoughts on maybe how we can go back to recovering latent variable inference, maybe in a non-distribution parametric way where we don't specify the distribution with the diffusion process? Right, right. Um, so as I said on the, like very early on in the talk, one, one reason VAs can work is because the, the, the generative model and the inference model, they cooperate, right? So they can match each other. Um, in some VAEs, like most of this work is being done by the generative model or by the inference model. So the inference model is very complicated and is able to match the posterior distribution. Whereas here, it's completely the other way around. So inference models are as simple as, as it can be. And then all the work is for the generative model to solve. And that does make optimization somewhat easier. And that's actually where a lot of the benefit comes from. Um, so I, I'd like definitely to try more general processes where this, this inference distribution is able to do a bit more. Uh, we did that a little bit in our paper called variational diffusion model. So what we do there is we stick actually with the same structure, but we learn these hyperparameters. So it, you know, we, we learn like a couple of parameters effectively in this inference, uh, in this inference model. Um, if you go much beyond that, you, you do, again, lose this property where you can evaluate intermediate steps. And that's, it just makes training a lot slower, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it would be a shame to lose that. Uh, if there's, yeah, if there's a way of making it more flexible while maintaining that, I would be very interested. Cool, thanks. All right, um, I'll move on to the, the last bit of the talk then. Um, so, Recently, you've seen a lot of results on text to image models. Uh, Noel highlighted some of them. Uh, you all put your hands up, so you're all are very familiar with this. Uh, there's a number of these models now. Uh, Dali 2 was kind of the first. Um, and there was a party, um, there's stable diffusion, there's mid journey, and, and many others. So, the one I was personally involved with is Imagine. So, this is the one I will talk about. Uh, it draws inspiration from these, some of these others. Uh, it's also, also concurrent work with, uh, with some of it. <clears throat> I'll, I'll first just show you a couple of uh, example generations just to show what these models can do. So they can do, they can combine concepts in quite non-trivial ways that we don't really think are in the data, but it is able to do them. Um, it does sophisticated rendering things like uh, transparency is able to do that quite well. Also shadows, as you can see. It um, is able to you know, combine concepts in quite crazy ways, like putting animals into space or uh, generating objects that we don't think are part of the training data. This would be very impractical if you had a, a coffee cup with holes in it um, or a bicycle with square wheels. That also doesn't seem very practical. Um, yeah, more animals in space or in the sauna. Um, or also very realistic images where uh, you could easily be mistaken that this would actually be just an, an image that some nature photographer took somewhere. <clears throat> um, or uh, combine yeah, very remote concepts like um, the teeth of a shark and, and the, the shape of a rock. Um, 
it, it seems quite creative to me. Um, also concepts that you probably wouldn't want to put together in the real world, like uh, spikes with slippers or spikes with a phone. This actually looks uh, pretty painful, I think. Um, this, uh, yeah, this doesn't look uh, very, uh, very appealing. And this looks uh, especially painful, actually. <clears throat> so, so that's what you've seen before. Those are, the, the, I think, quite amazing samples that show what these models can now do. Um, I'll talk a bit more now about how you actually arrive at this model class, how, how this actually works under the hood. So there's really four, four things that need to come together for this to work. One is data. Um, so I already talked about this. You need hundreds of millions of examples in order to learn all these sophisticated concepts. Um, there's the model. So it's a diffusion model with, with a couple of tricks that are actually important. Uh, there's the sampler, where you have a lot of hyperparameters that you can tune and a lot of choices you can make. And then you need to actually run this at scale. So I will talk just about the model and the sampler uh, here. Uh, so Imagine has three components in addition to just uh, the standard diffusion framework that I talked about earlier. And they're all important. Uh, the first is cascading. So rather than have a, a single model that generates an image in one go, it actually consists of three models. So you generate a small resolution image first, then you have a conditional diffusion model that generates a somewhat higher resolution image in the next stage. You condition on that again, and you generate the highest resolution sample. Um, and doing so, is, it's both much easier to train than training the model in one go. Um, it's much more stable, and the results are better. Um, there's a couple of tricks we use here. So one is that there is a there is a sort a, a training test mismatch between how we train these models and how we use them in for sampling. So when we train a upsampling model, it's conditioned on downsampled data from the exact dis, uh, the training distribution. So uh, it's conditioned on clean data. Uh, but when we use it for sampling, we actually plug in samples that are slightly off often. So in order to be robust to this, we need to add some noise uh, right to regularize the model. So we add noise to the uh, low resolution image that we condition on for the next stage. Um, just adding a bit of Gaussian noise seems to be enough. And then these models are, are quite robust. And you can also plug in, <laughs> you can also generate um, images by combining models. So party, if you actually see party samples now, often they will not just be party, they will be party upsampled by a diffusion model. Uh, so this also works. Um, so, the, the steps we take in generating samples is we first use a text encoder to get embeddings, uh, so numbers that represent the text that we put in. And then we put these embeddings together with noise into uh, a unit, which then predicts clean data. We do this a number of times to get our low resolution image. We take the embeddings in the uh, first generation, the first generated image, and we upsample, and then we do this again. And yeah, one thing to note here is that these embeddings they actually appear in every one of these stages, um, which might seem like it wouldn't be necessary, but actually it does uh, quite a lot, even in the, at the, at the upsampling stage. So just to convince you of that, here there's a low resolution image on the left, and on the right we have three different ways of upsampling them. So the first column here is with the original text prompt, and uh, the second column is with the original text prompt, but modifies modified to um, add that we want an oil painting. And the last column is one where we are saying we want it to be an illustration. Um, so the, the high level content is the same because it's already present in this low resolution image, but the, the texture is actually very different between, uh, between the columns. And that's the information that's still there in the text embedding, even when conditioning on low resolution data. Uh, another key trick that's in here, and that is actually even in autoregressive models like uh, Party, is called guidance. So in our setup, we have a diffusion model that takes in noise data X and label Y and turns it to an image X. Uh, we parameterize it often in terms of the epsilon, which, as I explained, is the same thing as modeling the, the score of the data distribution. Um, and now there's a trick called classifier guidance uh, that the folks at OpenAI came up with which is to modify our model prediction of the noise by adding in the gradient of a classifier model. So I won't actually talk about re-ranking as, as Noel promised, I'm sorry, uh, but this is kind of like a, a smooth way of doing re-ranking. 
so we have a classifier model that takes in the image and it spits out a prediction of the class or the label. And then we say, okay, we all only want samples that actually for which we're able to accurately predict the text that we put in. Uh, so we want images where the object is clearly visible in the image and those we consider to be good samples. So that's what classifier guidance does. <clears throat> so we had follow-up work to this, which you call classifier-free guidance, where instead of having an explicit classifier model, like a ResNet, we actually just use um, an implicit classifier, which, which we define through Bayes rule. So if you remember Bayes rule, the distribution of Y given X is proportional to the distribution of the, the density of X given Y divided by the density of the marginal density of X. Um, and then if we again take gradients like we did before, we get a gradient of the conditional distribution of X minus a gradient of the unconditional distribution of X. Uh, so the next step in order to actually do this in practice is we estimate both using diffusion models. So we basically have a conditional diffusion model and an unconditional diffusion model. Um, and we put them together like this. We have a weighting term and we add that into the noise prediction. And that's the same thing as doing classifier guidance, but now just using diffusion models. Uh, and in practice, we make things even easier. Uh, we actually just put in like a, a zero class whenever we want an unconditional prediction. And then during training, we also randomly mask out the, the conditional conditioning signal Y it's for some training points. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to trade off the, the sample diversity from the, the sample quality. So as Nal said, you basically want to optimize likelihoods if you, uh, if you really care about capturing the full data distribution. But if you just care about perceptual quality, maybe it's okay if you drop a couple of modes um, and you can do that by, by tweaking up this, this, uh, this, w, uh, this W parameter here. So as we add more, if we make W larger, we move along the curve in this direction. So we increase our clip score. So the clip score tells you how well can I identify the object that's in the image. And at least after some point, it increases the FID. So FID basically tells you how accurately I'm capturing the original distribution. Um, so we combine this with another trick called uh, dynamic thresholding. So when we modify these epsilon predictions, often they imply predictions of the clean image that are way outside of the range that uh, the original image was in. So you know, we know the original image can't be below zero, uh, the pixel values, or they also can't be above 255. Uh, but if we mess up this epsilon prediction by a lot, we might actually have predictions that lie outside of this range. So what we did originally is just clip to the, the, the range that we know the image to be in. Um, and that works, um, but if you really crank up this W parameter by a lot, then this happens too often. So you do so much clipping that you kind of go out of distribution. Um, so something that can work better in some cases um, is dynamic clipping, uh, dynamic thresholding. So what we do instead is we just calculate the percentile. So maybe we take the 99th percentile of the absolute values of our pixel values, and then we rescale the whole image so that 99% of the values are again within the range that we know that the original image was in. And uh, so this gives you the red curve, which is strictly better than a blue curve in this case. And then the final important ingredient of Imagine is text encoders. Um, so we experimented a lot with different encoders, different ways of inputting the, the text string that we're conditioning on. And what we find is that the bigger, the better. So we don't train our text encoders, they're actually frozen. You just take them off the shelf, uh, calculate the embeddings and put them into our neural net. And they have quite a dramatic effect um, on the, the, the scores that we're able to achieve. Um, so going from the small model to the large model, we get quite a, a significant improvement in visual quality and also especially in, in clip score. Um, I mean, it depends on how you normalize these things, right? That's, uh, it, it's state of the art, so I guess it's not low, but it's uh, yeah, whether, um, whether it's a, a particular score, a particular normalization that people use, I don't know what the, the what the, what the standard is, but. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Okay. Um, do you use sentence level embeddings or do you keep it uh, uh, in a token representation? Like, uh, the, the token level representation, okay. yeah. And, and it actually helps a lot with doing more complicated things like text. Mm -hmm. 
So the DALI 2, for example, they have a sentence level embedding. And because of that, they're, able, they're less able to like spell out words in an image. Mm. Do you think it's related to that, the fact that there is no uh, clear text in the images in DALI versus in Imagen? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, on this figure, the green line in terms of FID is lower than the yellow. Sure. Uh, what is the scale difference that it's, what is the difference between uh, how much more data did the green have than the yellow? So you would need to read the T5 paper to see how much training data the, the text models got. I think it's comparable between the models, just the model size is different. Um, and on the image side, the, the setup was exactly the same. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Just a quick question on, on this plot, actually. Um, are you holding the image generation decoder fixed whilst you're training, uh, whilst you're changing the text encoders, or is the generation of the changing? It's, uh, it's trained. So, um, I meant the architecture, sorry. Yeah, so the architecture, the architecture of the, the encoders, of the decoders, is indeed the same. But the, the only thing that changes is the, the size of the, is the, is the, the model that we use to the text embeddings. The, the image uh, model is exactly the same, but it is retrained separately for each of these models. And so presumably the, the output of the text, uh, different text models produces a different uh, embedding size. So are these then projected down for the uh, decoder or no? <clears throat> Um, so we use this in two ways in the model. One is at the sentence level where we're actually collapsing uh, the information. So that, that would need to be projected down to the same dimension. But we're also doing cross attention. So we're doing cross attention on the different tokens in the sentence. Um, so here, yeah, just the, the context that, you're, that you have in your attention uh, can increase. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm actually not sure whether these models um, actually have a different size embedding though. Um, it's mostly the parameters that produce embedding that are a different size. Um, so, yeah, surprisingly, we actually find that scaling this text model is more important here than scaling the generative model itself. So even with a somewhat smaller generative model, um, it, still, it still matters a lot uh, how big the text encoder is. We find that uh, using T5 XSL here, uh, outperforms a clip text encoder. So clip is uh, the text encoder is uh, what DALI uses. <clears throat> and at least on our set of problems, we, we find that uh, T5 works better. <clears throat> uh, we also find that T5, that Imagine uh, achieves state of the art on Coco, even without training on Coco. So Coco is a text to image data set, but it's quite small. So if you just train on that, you won't do very well. Um, but what we find is that we don't even need to fine tune in order to get good results there. <clears throat> and then we also had human raters compare Imagine against uh, some of these other models that we talked about before, and we find that generally Imagine is preferred. <clears throat> um, yeah, so for the last five minutes, I'm just going to give you a, a, a view on, on this, uh, this latest model that is currently under submission. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's on archive already. Uh, it's called video diffusion models. And what we do is we basically take this whole setup and we just add a the time dimension. So now we use video instead of images. Uh, so the, the unit, the architecture just becomes a 3D unit where we now have attention across time in addition to attention across space. And uh, these are some of the, uh, the samples that it produces. Um, so we can do uh, movement quite well um, and also we retain the, the rich textual descriptions that we can turn into images that we haven't imagined. So here's some more. Uh, so it's mostly scenes, and we can mostly do small, shorter videos at this point. There's more at the, the website, and also uh, you can have a look at the paper. Um, we also run this on all the standard benchmarks, like uh, the bare robot pushing that Noah also showed, and uh, things like kinetics and yeah, UCF 101. And uh, at least currently, we're also state of the art there. Um, so that's it for the material I've prepared. Um, if there's more questions, I still have some time to, to take them.